Good evening. The Omnibus Lecture Series guest speaker this evening knows all about global hotspots from Yemen to Afghanistan and Arab Spring in between. She has served as the chief correspondent for ABC News Network since 2008. Having served as chief White House correspondent for President George Bush administration, and prior to that, she has had experiences covering the day-to-day -day foreign and domestic stories from the White House. She has traveled to Pakistan and Afghanistan numerous times and to Iraq nearly 20 times to cover the ongoing conflict. She reports for ABC's World News with Diane Sawyer, Nightline, and other network broadcasts. In addition to her work for ABC News, she has written for The New Republic and is a frequent guest on PBS's Washington Week and Charlie Rose. She began her tenure at ABC News in 1999 as the network's State Department correspondent and became ABC's senior national security correspondent in May of 2004, reporting extensively from Iraq. From 1993 to 1998, she covered the Pentagon for National Public Radio. Prior to joining NPR in 1993, she was the chief correspondent at the ABC News Boston affiliate WCVB-TV. In addition to covering several presidential campaigns, she reported from the former Soviet Union, Africa, the Middle East, the Philippines, and Europe. She's the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Long Road Home, a story of war and family. Her coverage of the State Department after the attacks of 9-11 was recognized with a Peabody Award as well as an Emmy Award. She was the recipient of the 2007 International Urbino Press Award and the 2005 Daniel Pearl Award from the Chicago Journalist Association and a 1996 Overseas Press Club Award. Her reporting was also recognized with the National Headliner Award for team coverage of the 1988 presidential campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure this evening to present to you Ms. Martha Raditz, Chief Foreign Correspondent for ABC News. I always just listen to those and think, gosh, I have been around for a very long time. <laughs> I also, being in an academic environment, I, I get in a little bit of an awkward situation with some students. I recently was speaking to a graduate, some graduate students at Johns Hopkins in a very small little class, and, and after talking and after a similar introduction, one of the young women said, Miss Raditz, how would I follow in your footsteps? And I said, I'm sorry, it's too late for you. You would have had to drop out of college, drink a lot of beer, and play a lot of pool. <laughs> so I came to do what I'm doing today. So I'm a very bad example, and I always tell students that, and it's especially hard with my own children, my son who's in college now, who keeps reminding me that I did a very dumb thing when I was in college. I, I want to say a little bit about Fort Wayne. I, I came yesterday, and by far, it's the nicest place I've been all year. Then again, <laughs> no, it's really beautiful, and the people have been so terrific, and I really do truly love, and perhaps it's because of my sordid past in college that I love being in an academic environment. I'm inspired by students. I'm inspired by groups like you who come out and want to learn something. It is a wonderful experience, and 
it makes me very happy to be here. Um, I have traveled about 100,000 miles this year. I have been to probably more than that, but that's how many show up on my United Airlines frequent flyer miles. And that doesn't count the, the trips with the Secretary of State or Secretaries of Defense or, or whoever else you're traveling with, and certainly the President. I have, when I, when I come through passport control, when I come back in the United States, and I have several passports, because you have to, you work in the visas, so you have a passport at this embassy and a passport at another embassy, I always get, I always get the eye, the kind of the stink eye, when I, when, I, when I open up my passport and see where I've been. This year I've been to Yemen, I've been, I think, three, four times to Afghanistan, I have been to Pakistan, I have been all over the Middle East, um, and I'm about to go back to Iraq, which may be the last time in a long time as the U.S. starts to draw down its troops. I've also, I think, had a rather unique perspective. You have foreign correspondents who are based overseas, largely. I'm based in Washington, D.C. So I have not only been able to go overseas and see what's happening with my own eyes, I have the perspective of talking to, interviewing, and challenging policymakers and presidents over the year, over the years. So that to me has been the most rewarding in many ways. And, I, and I'll give you an example. I, you heard that I covered the last years of the Bush administration. That's when the war in Iraq was at its most difficult phase. And during that period, I'm sure you all remember, the administration at the time was saying that things were going quite well and they weren't. And to be able to see that firsthand and to come back and to be able to say to President Bush, wait a minute, I was just there. And he was, actually he was really quite wonderful to deal with and, and easy to cover and very personable. But I remember one press conference and standing in the East Room and asking the President a question, no matter how jaded, and I'm not at all, I'm quite the optimistic journalist and, and sunshiny, but no matter what your attitude toward anything, when you stand up in the East Room and you ask the President a question, it's a, it's a pretty great moment. And you can't believe you're there. And there, there are days I still can't believe I am where I am. Um, but I said to President Bush, do you believe as your intelligence reports indicate that Iraq is turning into a civil war. And he really looked at me and just said, well, I don't know, you know, it's hard for me to tell living in this big, beautiful White House. You've been there, I haven't. And I thought, okay, let's hear it for the decider. <laughs> but he, but, but doing that on a daily basis and, and trying to bring to the public and I am not one of those journalists who think we're just the greatest people in the world. I think we do the best we can. I think we make mistakes, but I think daily that we try to challenge, that we try to tell the truth. I always tell young journalism students, so there isn't always the truth. You don't always find the truth. You do the best job you can, but there are many different versions of the truth. So you can't always tell exactly what's happening. But, but I'm actually proud of the American public during those years, because despite what they were hearing in Washington, I think they got a picture of what was really happening in Iraq, and ultimately, President Bush took a different action in, in Iraq. He made a, a difficult decision to send in more troops, and it really did ultimately turn things around over there. No matter how you feel about the war, those changes made things at least better militarily in Iraq at the time. I first, I, I didn't grow up wanting to be a war correspondent, I really had no idea what I wanted to do, but I did want to cover the Pentagon. And, but I started covering the Pentagon in peacetime. Before that, I think my first introduction to conflict and seeing it and knowing what it really means and why it's so difficult to solve was going to Israel. And I went to, I was actually working for a local television station in Boston, but it was a pretty big huge television station and they apparently had a lot of money because they sent me all over the place too. And I covered the Intifada in 1988. And when I went over, I decided that what I wanted to do was just go to see the Palestinians, to go see the Israelis, talk to as many people as I could. 
And I chose a couple of people, some people I just happened on. I went to the West Bank and the Palestinians, and there was a wedding that day in 1988. And we taped that wedding, and we interviewed some Palestinians coming out of that wedding. And they said, we will grow, we will be stronger, we will have more children, we, we can get our land. The Israelis I interviewed were in a settlement in the West Bank, in a fraught. They were young, wonderful, idealistic, wanting to make peace with their neighbors. And I interviewed an Israeli soldier who was patrolling the streets of Ramallah, who was also very optimistic. And it broke his heart to have to push children away. And I interviewed some stone throwers. Back then it was just stones, some Palestinian stone throwers. It was a, a series that was eye-opening to me because for the first time I could see how tiny that land was. And I could see one side lived here and the other side lived there and how difficult a problem this would be. In 2000, I'd been working for ABC for about two years and we decided to do a nightline and that it would be great to go back and find all the people I'd interviewed 12 years before. That was kind of difficult because I had no idea where my notes were. But we did, a we did a little detective work, and believe me, looking for an Israeli soldier named Chaim was really hard. <laughs> and that's the only thing I had, except for our little video, and, we, and, and he was the hardest person to find. Well, I first went to the Israeli settlement of Frat and found the young idealistic couple. Over those 12 years, some of the children of their neighbors had been harmed in fighting with, the Pal with Palestinians. Palestinians felt the same. And they knew their children had been harmed in some sort of back and forth as well. They were no longer idealistic. In fact, the Israeli, the couple who weren't quite as young, had children who were now teenagers. And when I interviewed them, the parents were saying, we can't stand our neighbors, we don't trust our neighbors anymore, we don't want to, you know, they shouldn't live here. And I said, do you feel bad that you're saying this in front of your children? And she said, are you kidding? Our children think we're not tough enough on them because they grew up here. Now, you probably can tell the end of this story that when I talked to the Palestinians I met before, I found the wedding couple, everyone was hardened in their position. Everyone had a terrible story to tell about suffering on either side. And that to me, and the Israeli soldier I eventually found, by the way, he, he had become very observant. He uh, lived in a tiny little settlement. He couldn't speak English anymore because he hadn't for so many years. He just spoke Hebrew. And he too had hardened in his position and sort of forgotten his idealism from the years before. And that showed me how difficult it is in these conflicts and that in the end, they are about compromise and forgiveness. And you don't always want to compromise with or forgive someone you've been fighting with for years. Um, I then went on to cover the conflict in Bosnia, but very near the end of that conflict. And I think it was the first time I was really, really scared. And I decided when I'm really, really scared, I just joke around. Because we came down a, a sniper alley then, we came down some very terrifying territory, and I remember I'm just going to say, and I smoked a couple of cigarettes. I don't smoke, all right? But, <laughs> but that night it seemed like the thing to do. Um, and, I, uh, and I also that night, and I, I, I've told this story a couple of times, but it, it, it's one of the things people ask me about is I have two children. My daughter is now 30 and a lawyer, and my son is, is uh, 20, a sophomore in college. And they really grew up with me doing this. But when I went to Bosnia, and my daughter was about 16 then, 14, I guess, she was about 14 then. And back, those are back in the day when you had to like lug a suitcase around to set up a satellite phone and talk to anybody in, in the world. And I hadn't been in touch with my home for about 48 hours. And my daughter picked up the phone. And you know there were fighter jets going over. It was, you know, I was kind of huddled someplace in a building. and. Uh, I said, oh, hi, honey, it's mom. I'm sorry I've been out of touch. And she said, oh, mom, thank God you called. I've been thinking about dropping Latin. <laughs> so from that day on, I kind of knew that my children weren't home thinking about my safety every minute. <laughs> you know how kids are. They kind of think about themselves. 
in a wonderful, wonderful way. I have my, my daughter, who does not worry about it as much. My son actually does, and I think, I was telling some of the students today, I think it's because my son was nine years old on 9-11. And because we live in Washington, D.C., and we live a couple miles from the Pentagon, and my husband happened to be in the Pentagon that day, he's a journalist as well, that that hit home. I think it hits home for kids in D.C. And, and certainly New York more than others. I mean, my relatives out west, their kids who are the same age don't really think about it that much. And then we had a sniper in D.C. the following year. So I think deep in my son's heart, there's a little vulnerability, despite the fact that he's a football player. So he sort of paid me back during high school by, by having me watch his football games like this. <laughs> um, I have come to go to these war zones only because the first time I went, I wanted to go again, and I wanted to go again after that. And the reason I wanted to go, beyond the fact that I am a reporter and I love the curiosity, and I love the disciplined curiosity of going to all these places, is because I loved the people I met. I loved talking to Iraqis about what it meant to them, but I loved listening to stories of soldiers and Marines on the ground. I have met, and, and I am, frankly, we are drawing down by the end of this year. We are going to be out of there, the military. And for me, it's pretty emotional thinking back, because I don't really think back very often. I, I go in such a high velocity all the time and go from one place to the next that, that I sincerely, in the last couple of weeks, haven't really been able to sleep thinking about the people I've met over this decade. Just remarkable people. Um, there were a couple of young reporters who were asking me today how I remain objective if I'm with the military all the time. I remain objective about what they do and how they do it. I am not the least bit objective about sacrifice and those who have wounded, who've been wounded or lost their lives or the families back home who've supported them. And I'm proud of that. I am a reporter. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but I, I am, I am not, you know, your classic sort of scud stud, go out, chase the bullets. I have a heart about this, and I have tried very hard over the years to show people what it's like for those people. I, I'm going to tell you about a couple, and because I have such a history with him, there's a lieutenant colonel I met in 2004 who named Gary Valesky who on the very first night he took command, his platoon was ambushed. And one of his platoons was ambushed. And he lost eight soldiers that first night. Now today, that may not seem like so astonishing for any of us because we hear about that. But that was one of the first big losses in the war. I met him then. I met him two more deployments in Iraq. I met his wife. I met his son. And last month, I was in Afghanistan with Brigadier General Gary Bolesky. That's how long he has been at this. He has lost so many soldiers, so many friends. He lives in Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, the day of the Fort Hood, Texas massacre, I was at work and immediately called Bolesky's wife, who was in her house with her son. <coughs> And if you can imagine knowing your, your husband is fighting a war and there's someone outside shooting the people at Fort Hood, it was pretty unimaginable. There was, in that same battle in 2004, a young sergeant named Robert Miltenberger. And Robert Miltenberger, when I first went to interview all of these soldiers, none of them had talked about what they'd just been through. And I asked Sergeant Miltenberger one question, and he broke down sobbing. And that was my first, even in that first year of covering the war, and a, a lot of it was from the Pentagon that first year in 2003, but when I first started going over, 
I think all of us were so caught up in the policy and all of us were so caught up in was this a bad idea and why did we go in if there weren't weapons of mass destruction. But when I first started meeting people like Valesky or Milton Berger or some of the other soldiers I met during that period, it, it really brought the whole war home to me and I hope and have tried to bring the whole the war home to others. I have also, uh, somebody asked me today now that the wars are winding down and the war in Afghanistan is not over. I know President Obama kind of likes to talk about the conflict and we're drawing down. We're, we're committed to having a whole lot of troops there until the end of 2014. So that is a story that continues. But someone asked me today what I was gonna do now. And I thought, why do people keep at, maybe I'm not gonna have a job, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I cover foreign affairs, so I have also, I, I was in Yemen in March I want to tell you, I, I, I want to personalize this because I'm just thinking none of you are going to be in Yemen in the near future. <laughs> Which is unfortunate because it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to. It, it surprised me. Sana'a is, of course, old. The capital is old and ancient. The people could not have been more friendly. The old part of that city is absolutely beautiful. And no tourists. You know, you just didn't have to fight the lines. You didn't have to do anything. The, when we go to places like this, just to give you an idea, we do travel with security. Um, not a lot of security. It's one guy, and I believe in Yemen, he couldn't carry a weapon. So it's like, what are you going to do, actually, Mick, if someone you know, co comes after me? So I don't know, I'm going to run like hell. But <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try to take you with me. Um, but the protests there were just starting. And just to show you that I'm not very good at predicting, um, I would have guess that they wouldn't have lasted very long. And the reason I would have said that is because in Yemen, it, it appeared to me that the huge majority of men chew cot all day. Cot is a, it's, it's somewhere between a stimulant and a narcotic, and by that I mean they chew it and they, it's, it's like a really like a thousand cups of coffee, and then they just completely crash for the rest of the afternoon. So there were a lot of the people I was talking to, including diplomats, were saying if you could get a protest going past noon, maybe something will happen, but I, <laughs> but I don't think you can. But since then, those protests have continued. I think the places that I am most keeping my eye on now are Yemen and certainly Syria. And if any of you have kept up with what's happened in Syria, the UN says there are now 3,500 people who have been killed in Syria. The hardest part about Syria, the hardest part about Yemen is there's really no coverage there. Reporters are not in Syria. Reporters are really not in Yemen. It's extremely difficult. I've been to Yemen twice, and it took months and months and months and months to get visas. And when you want a visa, like something happens, you're not gonna, if something's happening in the streets over there, you're not gonna get your visa. Like, if thing, like after um, the U.S. killed Anwar al awlaki in Yemen, the terrorist leader who was the American-born radical cleric, they were offering up visas. And I think part of that was because the Yemeni president was about to return. So, they have, so it's very difficult knowing what's going on there. Although when I think back over the years, and particularly in Syria and Egypt and all these places, you, you, this is how we get our news now. We get our news from cell phones. We get our news from Facebook or, or Twitter overseas a lot because sometimes it's the only way you can get it. But thank goodness for that social media because we wouldn't know half of what we know now without that. But Syria is particularly terrifying. I think there are areas of that, of, of Syria, and they are asking now for the kind of help they got in Libya. I don't think that'll happen, but you never know. Uh, Libya as well. I was, uh, oh, I forgot Libya. I was in Libya this year too. I was in Libya last month. Um, Libya, Libya was one of those places. I, I, I went to Libya out on the Kersage right after NATO started bombing targets in Libya and was with the crews that rescued some of the Americans who were, who's the, the fighter jet that went down. And then I went this last month with Secretary Clinton to Libya. And I decided that we kill dictators or, or terrorists when I'm either about to get on a plane or on a plane. Because when I was, I, I jumped off Secretary Clinton's trip after our trip into Libya. And while I was flying home from Malta on a commercial flight, they killed 
Qaddafi. And uh, Al-Laki, I had just arrived in Afghanistan to find out he had been killed and went on the air with that. And then the night that we killed Osama bin Laden, I was on a packed 777 in Washington, D.C., heading for Afghanistan uh, with a stop in Dubai. We fly commercial all the way there. And uh, I started looking at my Blackberry. I'd already settled in with my little slippers and, you know, was ready to go and saw that the president was going to talk and had to talk my way off that plane. And in fact, I went up to the flight attendant and I, people had heard me on the phone. I'm usually really discreet on the phone, but they'd heard me saying, I need to get off this plane, right? And so I went up to the flight attendant and I said, we haven't reported this yet, but I think they killed bin Laden. She's like, we'll get you off. So I'm sure the 300 something people on that plane are really mad at me because I'm sure they were really late. And the thing that I was nervous about the whole time was that someone was going to tweet that, that I had just gotten off a plane and said Bin Laden had been killed. Um, that, that actually was a night that, oh, I'll just tell you a little family story too, that my son was, my, I call my, my son hates it when I go to Afghanistan. So when I got off the plane, I said, hey, I'm not going to Afghanistan, by the way, and he was watching TV with a bunch of friends. And about 20 minutes later, he called back and said, Mom, what is going on? I just heard on TV that the president's going to make an announcement about national security, and he was very nervous. And I said, okay, you get the scoop. You cannot tell your friends. I think they've killed bin Laden, but you can tell your friends it's good news. Um, and that's all you can tell them. And my son was one of those kids in front of the White House that night. And I, in a way, that was so full circle for a child like him to be able to go down to the White House and, I, and say, we got him. So that was, that, was, uh, that was his story. But the, um, so we have Yemen, we have Syria, and the biggest problem in the coming months, and I think the single place to watch is Iran. The IAEA, the UN watchdog, nuclear watchdog agency is saying, and, and this is one of those, as if we didn't know, I think that the Iranians are trying to make a nuclear weapon even though they have said again and again they aren't. There was a pause in that program in 2003. Um, again, this was a period where President Bush was understandably very concerned about Iran as well, but then the intelligence agencies came back and said that the Iranians had apparently paused their program. Pausing no longer. And what you have to watch in the coming months, not only are US troops pulling out of Iraq, and you'll have to see what kind of influence Iran has in Iraq, but they are also, the Israelis, you have to wonder how long they're going to sit and just let the Iranians get closer and closer, um, as the intelligence agencies say, to building a bomb, and whether they take some action in the coming months and what the reverberations are from that if in fact they do that. As I said, I'm not really worried about job security at this point. I think there's always going to be something that happens. I was in Iran a couple of years ago and of all the things I've seen in war zones, that I was the most uncomfortable in Iran. I was uncomfortable because we were detained for a couple of days and it's really easy for me to say it was just a couple of days now but there was a point that I thought it might be a couple of years but they took our passports because we had shot video of some of their police officers checking to make sure women had their headscarves on correctly. And they took us to the narcotics division of the police department, which of course made me even more nervous because I figured they'd put something in our van. Um, but they had not. But my, my visit to Iran started, I'd, we'd been there a couple of days already when that happened, and we went down into the streets where the protesters were and you've seen video, I'm sure, of this, just burning the president in effigy and, and shouting, we hate America, down with America. And I'm walking next to a guy, an, an Iranian man, and I said, um, I, I asked him what he was doing, he said, we hate America. He said, where, where are you from? Um, <laughs> said, uh, you should ask. <laughs> I'm from America. And he looked at me and he said, Welcome. <laughs> so things are not always as you as you think they will be in all these places. They that that when I talk about these lessons and want to tell you anecdotes like that, it really is because what you see is not always the truth. That man probably didn't want to be there. 
That man probably had someone telling him he had to be there, he had to protest, or something might happen to his family. You, you just never know what is behind the decisions that people make. It is really hard to, I, I used to be, when I was a young reporter, I used to stay away from any sort of analysis or opinion or, you know, what do I know? I've only been here for two weeks or I've only been here for two days. But it's really all we can do. You really do try to go over there and understand another culture. You, you act as sort of a sponge. You listen to everybody. You talk to as many people as you can possibly talk to. And, and I'm happy in the position I'm in now. You notice there's lots of senior this, senior that, senior this. Um, that I feel confident when I go on our network or on Charlie Rose or on wonderful Gwen Eiffel's program that I have been to all these places, that I have some base of knowledge, that I have interacted with people in ways, any way I can, to help people understand the difference between that protest and perhaps a guy who was forced into that protest, or an insurgent in Iraq who set an IED in the road and didn't really want to set that IED in a road, but, but someone else had a gun to his daughter's head. It is not always as clear cut as people think. We, we, use, we use this term a lot, fence sitters. What are fence sitters? The war could go either way. That certainly could be the case in Afghanistan. It could still be the case in Iraq. But the fence sitters are the people who say, okay, I, should I help the Americans? Because if the Americans are leaving, I probably shouldn't help the Americans because someone's gonna shoot me after they go. And, and sometimes it's that simple, or someone's gonna shoot my child, or someone's gonna do something terrible to me. Um, so when I go to these conflicts, I do try to talk to as many people as I can. During the very early years of the war in Iraq, and, it, it, and I, I guess it's good that it started out sort of slowly, and because I probably never would have gone back if the first couple of times I'd gone in there once it was terrifying. Um, I, we, we used to go in there with the military. We'd fly into Kuwait on a commercial flight and then we'd wait days or hours or whatever it took to fly in. And they did the corkscrew landings and they did the terrifying takeoffs to avoid any satellites or small arms fire. And then once you got there, you, people often criticize us, oh, well, are you really getting this, the whole story when you embed? And the truth is, it's the only way you could do it particularly for TV. You, you really just had to be with the military or you had, you know, unless I wanted to hire my own private army to take me around. First of all, we're very visible, so we had to embed. We had other reporters who, we, we had local reporters helping us out. That's always hard too. I, I remember a time in Fallujah and we drove through the street very fast. It was, it was not a good time there and the convoy I was in, the Humvee in front of us, there was a car that came out of nowhere and was heading towards the convoy and the, hum the gunner in the Humvee in front of him shot at that car and killed the driver. And I don't think the driver had done anything wrong other than turn down the wrong street. But you also, you talk to that soldier and his job was to protect that convoy. So we were trying to find out what the reaction in Fallujah was after that, and you, we got it from a local reporter. Now the local reporter, again, is from Fallujah, and you don't know what his challenges are in trying to report those stories either. So there, there were periods of time there, and there are still periods of time in, in other places and other conflicts where you have to rely on local people to help you out, and you're not always sure that they're not getting pressure from somewhere else. So that is one of the complications of my job. And later on, we'd go into Iraq and the military, I, 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 I've been covering the military so long, I really truly like, my, one of my producers said, you know, it's like going with David Beckham. It's like, hey, how are you, Martha? How are you, Martha? I mean, walking down the streets, I know everybody. So I can get around pretty easy and they will, they will step back if I had to go. I mean, during the war in Iraq, they would basically step back let me go off, let me interview whoever I wanted in that village, let me interview just regular Iraqis to talk about what was happening with them. So I got a lot of cooperation and felt that I had quite a bit of freedom and that just came from years of covering Iraq. Afghanistan, 
I, I can get around almost anywhere in Afghanistan as well, but you really can't drive anywhere. I, I don't, the stories you see are really the only places you can go that are safe around. I, I mean, I go to Kabul, we stay in Kabul, we have a compound in Kabul, we have security in Kabul. Kabul is getting more and more dangerous in certain parts of it. I'm, if you follow the news in, in those cases, it's, it's getting, um, pretty scary there in certain places. It's, so we take the precaution, whatever precautions we can, but I still go with the military. I still have to go to the combat outposts and go with the military. I, I'm gonna wrap up here and let you ask me some questions, but I, I wanna just say one thing about Afghanistan and going forward here. I think as a nation, understandably, we are not paying much attention to a place where we still have close to 90,000 troops. 90,000 Americans are still serving there. I think we'll probably pay less and less attention to what happens in Afghanistan because understandably this country is in a crisis of its own with the economy, with the jobs. You do think about that. But I think it is so important to stay informed and you are all doing that but to help others stay informed. I worry going forward when these troops start coming home about a gap, about a gap between civilians and military that has existed and grown over the last few years. They are in a separate chart. I, I bet a lot of you know people in the military. A lot of places in the country, people don't. They know no one in the military. They know no one's relatives in the military. But for military families, I think they've, they feel separated from society in ways. It's not gonna be Vietnam. People aren't gonna come home. People, aren't, it, people will be wonderful to them. But it's also, they separate themselves. We separate from them. And I think in many ways, we should all try to be a bridge to the military, some way to show appreciation. I happen to work with the wounded. I happen to work through a foundation that my colleague, Bob Woodruff, who was blown up and badly injured in 2006, but is doing so phenomenally well, have worked with the wounded over the years. We're going to have so many people who have post-traumatic stress disorder who come home and are unemployed. Uh, the unemployment rate for veterans is, is higher than the average person, which is remarkable given what they've been through. So I think it is really important to somehow reach out to the military community. And again, I think I'm preaching to the choir here because I think you probably do it and you have people you know. But to expand that in some way because we are going to have people who A, have had adrenaline running through their systems for 10 years. And believe it or not, that's actually a problem. There's an adrenaline junkie thing that can set in because this war is unlike, these wars are unlike any other. In Vietnam, you might have had firefights every 20 days, every 30 days. Every single time those troops go outside that wire or are inside the wire, getting hit by rockets or mortars, their adrenaline is pumping all the time. It is fight or flee in that bloodstream all the time. So you have a lot of these young guys and women coming home who have had that going on for a long time. It's why they're driving their motorcycles off. It's why they're drinking more. There are a, a slew of things this country is gonna have to take care of in the decades going forward, not to mention the number of amputees and, and brain injured we have. So that's sort of from my heart about how strongly I feel about that and reaching out to that community in, in any way you can. And I would love to take questions about anything you wanna ask me about. Thank you very much. I didn't look at my watch. I gotta make sure I'm doing the time thing, right? <laughs> Thank you, we all love Gwen. We certainly do. Um, my question to you is, what do you think about in Afghanistan our continuing use of drone strikes? I hear from many pundits that this is only um, incensing the people against us. 
and making it much dif more difficult for us to have any kind of positive ending to this. Well, that's, I'm, gra I'm glad you asked that question because I think it's, uh, honestly, it's a great question and I think the country needs to debate that and I think it has not been debated. I think it, when you have, when you have unmanned aerial vehicles, when you have a pilot who's sitting somewhere in New Mexico or somewhere in, Lang in Langley, Virginia, piloting a deadly aircraft and then they get in the minivan and then they go home to the wife and kids, it's a little bit different than when you have someone literally risking their lives. Now, the good news is you don't lose anybody that way. You don't lose any Americans. But does that make war easier? Should we deb be debating this? Is it easier for someone to make a decision about a drone strike than it is to go up in a fighter jet, which I did last year and heard the dialogue back and forth and, and we could see below that there was a school and they didn't drop bombs. So I think because it's all classified, because we know so little about the program, the debate hasn't been as robust as it should be. Yes, in some of these areas, and it's Pakistan mostly where the drone strikes are, that we're making enemies and sometimes you hit the wrong guy. Those, those drones can see a remarkable amount. I mean, they, they do something called pattern of life for the days before and they are months and months. I mean, they did it with bin Laden, all sorts of surveillance equipment so you can see who comes, who goes, then you follow that guy, then you follow that guy. And that's what they do beforehand. I mean, the um, Batula Massoud, who was a Pakistan Taliban leader in Pakistan, who th those drones could see him walking up on the roof. They saw someone massaging his legs. It turned out to be his wife, I guess. They could see him go back and forth. They could see physical features. You can see an enormous amount in that video, but you can't see inside buildings. You can't, I mean, I, I've seen some of these, these videos from these different platforms. And when you look at them, I remember very early on, this wasn't a drone, but it was a helicopter strike. You could see figures running and they were killed by Apache helicopters. And if you looked at that out of context, you would think they just totally killed two guys who were innocent. But if the context, they had been chasing them for ages, they had seen them put down explosive devices, but on the other hand, there are times when they think they're putting explosive devices down and they're, you know, burrowing for fuel or there, there are mistakes that are made and there are mistakes in manned and unmanned aircraft. But I think the unmanned is something the country really needs to, to talk about. I guess you, you are. Good evening, Martha. Uh, we're uh, glad you're here tonight. Thank you. Uh, on a uh, lighter note, could you tell us uh, about your match matchmaking experience? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I just got some pictures from my matchmaking. I'm batting a thousand on matchmaking. Um, I set up a, it, it was a uh, fighter pilot in, who I met in 2005 in Iraq. He, he actually wasn't flying, he was on the staff of one of the generals in Baghdad. And I had actually, he's a Marine. I, I tell this little sidebar here because his name's Tony. So I had been out in Fallujah all day and I couldn't get back and I ended up having to call the army to help me get a helicopter back because the Marines were dead set about not taking me back because um, they had their rules. That's the Marines. Marines are only happy when they're miserable or making me miserable. <laughs> so I I did, uh, so I end up flying back and I run into the mess hall and Tony's sitting there and we end up having conversation and I tell him the army got me back as the damn Marines, you know, and he's a Marine, of course, I'm needling him. So Tony and I ended up staying in touch and he um, was clearly interested in meeting someone. And my colleague, Andrea Canning, who's a correspondent at ABC, was clearly meeting, wanting to meet someone as well. So I kind of put them together on email, and the bottom line is I just got the Halloween pictures from Tony and Andrea, who have two lovely little girls now, and got married. But at the wedding, my toast was, and it was all Marines, of course. You know, there are uh, hundreds of Marines there. And uh, if, if anybody talks about jointness, they're just kidding. They're big rivals, big rivals. It's, it's Army-Navy kind of thing going. And I got up and said, 
you know who we really have to thank tonight for this wedding is the United States Army. <laughs> because if they hadn't gotten me back to that, that mess hall that day, I never would have met Tony. So they're adorable and that was really fun, so the matchmaking. I should also add that covering the White House, I was talking to some people earlier, I didn't love covering the White House because for, I'm sort of an independent operator. You go in a giant bubble. You, are, you go with 150 other reporters all covering exactly the same story. And you're, I, I kind of joked that it was like probably what covering the news in the Soviet Union was like a long time. You know, you go here, you go there, you go there. The president goes here, he goes there, he goes there. It, and, and then you move on to the next location. I mean, the stuff I told you about, like standing in the East Room and all that is fantastic, or sitting in the Oval Office, and there were two trips I came back from Iraq that President Bush asked me into the Oval Office to talk about the trips with him, and that was, that was pretty amazing to sit there with the President. So th those were great perks, and I shouldn't say that, gosh, I didn't like covering the White House so much, but I love what I do and I love getting out and I love being an independent reporter more than I liked being in that bubble. We have a fantastic White House reporter who is like, born to be a White House reporter because he loves politics so much, um, Jake Tapper, and he, he goes at lightning speed all the time and, and uh, does a great job. So we're very compatible. He loves what he does. I love what I do. Good evening. I have actually two questions. One is I'm curious to know uh, how it is to travel with Secretary Clinton. And the other question I have is do you uh, get involved with any of the nation building or governance actions that are going on in either Iraq or Afghanistan? Um, traveling with Secretary Clinton, she's, she's terrific to travel with, actually. She always comes back and talks to everybody. She's very, uh, I mean, she's very, she's, she's really great to travel with. Uh, and she is, you go over there with her, she's a rock star over, I mean, she really is. People just, uh, you, uh, young women especially, I mean, she is just such a, an icon to those young women. But she's great, she's, you know, she is a grind. She is constantly reading her briefing books and doing other things. In terms of what do I cover, do I cover nation building and the, and the NGOs? Is that what you mean over there? Yes, are we you do. aware of? Yeah, we do, I do when I can, but I generally go with the military when I go. We have a reporter, um, Nick Schifrin, who lives in Pakistan, but he goes back and forth to Afghanistan and Pakistan quite a bit and, and does a lot of that reporter. And, it, and it's what I was talking about too. You can't, you can't just rely on me if you want a complete picture of the of what's going on. I mean, you can't some days if I'm, you know, on Washington Week or something like that, but it's, it's, if you want a full picture of what's going on in these places, you have to hear several reports, I think, from several different angles. Thank you. You briefly touched on uh, the ramping up of the nuclear weapons by, or, and you th now that Pakistan has them and Israel has them, do you think that in the new Arab Spring coming in, into fold, is that going to be a very hot spot over there? I think, I think nuclear weapons al always make, thank you for your question, I think nuclear weapons always make uh, the, the area a little more exciting. And um, it's, it's one thing you have to think about with, with nuclear weapons in Iran and all these other places. All these places saw Muammar Gaddafi give up his nuclear programs, give up his nuclear weapons, and hey, look what happened to him. So you have to ask yourself, is that an, an incentive to others like Iran to make sure they have nuclear weapons and never give them up so it doesn't happen to them? I mean, we're in a position with Iran where you either say, okay, we're gonna live with, with Iran having the bomb, or somebody's going to do something about it. If they're going to live with Iran having a bomb, because Iran wants a bomb, then you have to do something else about your policy. You have to approach it in a different way. Um, I, you know, the sanctions, they're going to have more sanctions. Israel's probably going to go, oh really? That didn't work so well in the past couple of years. So 
Yes, nuclear weapons are very complicated. Pakistan, there's a, a really good piece in the Atlantic about Pakistan and how they move their nuclear weapons around and how they're so paranoid about the U.S. getting at the nuclear weapons. Um, it's reported that the U.S. has teams to guard nuclear weapons, which I have certainly heard from um, reporting as well, that the U.S. is deeply concerned about that and, of course, any conflict between India and Pakistan. You want, to, you want to comment at all on what you predict for the future of Iraq when we leave? I'm really bad at predicting the future, kind of like I predicted that the protests in Yemen wouldn't go anywhere. Um, it's, it's always dangerous to predict. I, I, I will base my prediction on what I've heard from, from various sides on this. There are people who are terribly concerned because the military is pulling out and think it's a bad idea that we didn't leave more people there to train, to further train the Iraqi security forces. The reason they worry about that is because the intelligence gathering of the Iraqis isn't great. Al-Qaeda is not completely gone from Iraq, for instance. That if you can't gather intelligence, that can lead to raids that go wrong. That can lead to more of what the woman was talking about there, about, about striking people who you shouldn't be striking. The medevac, and certainly what the Shiite-dominated government will do with the Sunnis. On the other hand, there are people who say, look, you gotta leave sometime. They don't really want us there anymore. I mean, Maliki is in a position where he couldn't really advocate keeping troops any longer, and I'm not sure he really wanted them. So I, I think nothing will happen fast. I think this is a history that has a decade before we write it to know what's happening. So you'll all, it's, it's like what we do to people, you'll play this tape back when, you know, in two months it <laughs> goes down the tubes or something. But I, 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 think it's, I think it's hard to predict. But the last few years, it's certainly the security situation has certainly improved. And I think the lives of people in some areas too. Anybody else? You. I got a question. Okay. Um, uh, fairly recently, the government lifted the ban on gays and uh, lesbians in the military. So don't ask, don't tell is yep. no more. Um, people said this was going to lower the morale of the military. Other people said it could actually raise the morale because it opens the door for people being honest about their sexuality. Now, you've covered the Pentagon for a number of years. You've served with soldiers. You've seen it from the brass on down. What's your sense of how um, allowing people to serve more openly in the military? What's your sense of how that might affect the military? Well, it ha the Don't Ask, Don't Tell happens to be the first story I covered in 93 when I started covering the Pentagon. So I, I have seen that go through the years. And at, when it was, I mean, all the brass opposed it then. But you have seen, and I think it's true, I think they just thought it's time. And I think part of that is because through 10 years of conflict, I, th I think most of the people in the military probably have somewhat of an idea who they're serving with and what their, what their life is like. And I think most of them don't care. I really do. I mean, the soldiers, just before the, the ban was officially lifted, I was in Afghanistan and I asked a bunch of guys and women, what they thought about it, and they just don't care. I mean, they, they got enough to worry about. It's, it's I, I mean, I, I still think some of the brass is concerned. You've heard them testify. Um, I, I was concerned in the beginning when you hear, you know, the, the Commandant of the Marine Corps saying, you know, this is something that we don't want, whether that trickles down, but I, I don't see any evidence of that. I, I, I mean, you're always gonna get people who, who won't like that no matter what. But in so many ways, it's, it's, you know, it's what society is, it's the way society is as well. So I don't think unit cohesion, any of that. I, I have a, someone I've known for decades who was the, in the first class of female naval aviators. She was commissioned in 1973. She was in a class of eight. And the story she was, she was spoke at the Smithsonian the other night. It was a fantastic presentation. It's online, by the way, if you want to see it. But she's... She, she went through the history of that, and there was um, the Air Force, the head of the Air Force, in the 90s was asked if a woman was more qualified, if it would affect readiness, if you didn't hire that woman, would you still hire a man? And he said yes. 
And okay, all right. And, and you know, it was the same sort of thing. Women are gonna go there, unit cohesion, you can't all do it, you know, you can't. I mean, it's, the women in this past decade have done just remarkably well, just remarkably. I mean, they're flying fighter jets all the time. They're, they're on the front lines every single day. So, I, I mean, even the other day, I um, interviewed the head of special operations who is the Navy SEALs who did the Bin Laden raid. And he said he thought it was time for the Navy SEALs to open up to women because it's not all about pull-ups. And it isn't. I mean, we all have, I said to the students today, and I'll, I'll go to the girl question, okay, like what it's like to, <laughs> to be a girl covering conflict, a woman, whatever. Um, and, and it's, I think we all have gifts. I, I don't want to be a guy. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be like the guys, but I want to be as good as the guys. And I want the guys to know I'm as good as they are. And there's always going to be that little prove yourself when you go there. I happen to have a sense of humor about it. I think that's important. I think if you just get hardened and deal with people in ways. And, and I think probably the gay and lesbians in the military, first of all, you know, they get to talk about it now. They get to be, they get to, you know, show pictures of their children or their partner or whatever. And it, I think people just will move on. I, I do this a lot, sorry. It's distracting. <laughs> I, I, I literally, on some, I know I do it on Gwen's show, and I, I really have to sit on my hands sometimes. It's really bad. Right, thank but, you. Thank you so much for that question. We have a question over here. Okay. I don't have a specific question, but I wanted to ask you to just talk a little bit more about uh, Pakistan. You know, our military puts so much money into their military. And I just wonder if... Billions and billions and billions of dollars. Do we, know, do we have a plan? I mean, um, do we know what we're doing? Pakistan. We need Pakistan. We can't... You, you might have heard Admiral Mullen when he left, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, say some pretty hard things about Pakistan. He was on his way out. I interviewed the head of the new commander in Afghanistan a few days after that, and he said some very hard things. And I said, doesn't it make you mad that Pakistan continues to not cooperate in some ways? And, and that means lives of American soldiers. And he said, it makes me mad every single day. The plan has been the same year after year. They pressure Pakistan, and Pakistan comes back and you know, doesn't let anybody in there, kicks out our trainers, kicks out whatever CIA people are operating there, and then we're left with less intelligence, less um, looking after what the Pakistanis are doing. So it, I, I think that's, Pakistan is, I mean, there's so many places in the world that we can worry about, but pack it, and they're, you know, and they have nuclear weapons. It's a great combination. <laughs> but, I, but I do think, I mean, the billions and billions and billions of dollars we've given them is just extraordinary. And first of all, I don't think we really know where it's gone. I, I think there's not a whole lot of accounting where it's gone. Um, I've gone out with the Pakistani military. I actually, a couple of years ago, I say a couple of years ago about everything because I have no idea when I did all this stuff. It's all a blur. Um, it's like, I'll, I'll be there in two minutes, hon. You know, it's the same thing. It's, um, it's in, in that Khyber Pass. I mean, we're so dependent on the Khyber Pass to bring in our supplies to the troops in Afghanistan. And to me, the most frightening thing about the Khyber Pass was you, thought, you think you're going to fall off at all times. It's like driving along Highway 1 in California without a guardrail. Um, with three trucks crammed there. But, but you know, I think 80% of our military equipment goes through the Khyber Pass, so we desperately need Pakistan's help. They're still mad about the bin Laden raid and not telling them, but you know, the military and intelligence officials were in a quandary about if we tell them, they may tell the people who we're trying to get. So I think that was the bottom line on that. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Martha, you, you tell us about a lot of travel, an inordinate amount of travel and a lot of danger in your life, which leads me to the question, is there a long line of talented people who want your job? <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting because I think there probably, there probably is. Um, we, we were actually fighting amongst ourselves at ABC to who would go back to Iraq. 
Uh, I won that fight, it was an arm wrestle, you know, what can I say? Um, I, I think because it's a challenging story, I think because it's life and death and war and that people want to do it. I, I, I should take that back, I don't think there's a long line. I think a lot of people think I'm nuts and, but I think people also understand. I mean, it's, it, it's one of the things I told the students today you need to be passionate about something in your life. You need to find whatever it is. And it may involve risk, it may involve great risk, but you need to find a passion. It's why my children ultimately understand what I do. I mean, my husband's a journalist, he understands. But my son, who does not like it when I go over there and basically won't speak to me while I'm there, he knows that I am, I think it's important, that I have to do it, and that if I didn't think people appreciated it, I wouldn't do it. If I didn't think I was telling people something that hopefully they learned something from, I wouldn't do it. I mean, I, I'm actually, you know, I feel like I'm Dr. Phil, or talking to Dr. Phil up here a little bit tonight, but, but I, I am going through a sort of, I told you I can't sleep, and it's not because I'm dreaming about danger. It's th this was such an important period in my life. I mean, it will continue to be, but it was so profound. And, you know, again, when I think about, and I, I, I'm not gloomy about this. I, I have met extraordinary people. I've met people whose bodies have been blown up, and today, you know, a young soldier whose legs got blown off, and I was there in a combat support hospital, sent me a DVD of his wedding last week, and he, he had a kilt on. And he was so fantastic. So it is when you see those stories and when you see those people, you, you want to keep doing it. And, and foreign affairs is, is just vitally important to this country. I know the focus in the country, unless something huge happens, is, is going to be domestic for a while. It really is. But our future depends on the globe, not just our country. And, and we have to keep doing that. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Of I don't mean to keep checking out. I'm just trying to be good to my very kind host. So, <laughs> Of all of the generals that you've come in contact with over the years, during all the conflicts, in your opinion, who has been the closest or the most compassionate with their soldiers? Uh, Pete Corelli, who's the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. Um, he, is, he is also, actually he's in my book too, and he's somebody I met in 2004. In fact, General Corelli is someone I, who the day I heard about the story where the soldiers had been killed, and, and that night in April, I was, it's, and I had just met General Corelli, and I said I would love to do a nightline on that, and he said, we'll, we'll make sure it happens. And he's the one who got all those soldiers lined up for me and let me talk to them on any terms I wanted to. He's also the person who right now is more involved with suicide prevention, traumatic brain injury. He spent so much time at Walter Reed and in San Antonio at uh, the Burn Center there. He, he, he travels all over the country. He, um, I hate to keep telling these stories about that sound depressing, but um, the kid who just got married, Mark Little, when I met him at the Combat Support Hospital in 2007, and we were doing a story on the Combat Support Hospital, which is basically the MASH, um, and Mark came in and they were traumatic amputations, in other words, his legs weren't there, but we spent all day with him. He didn't really know we were there, and you, you enter into a privacy thing that you can take film, I mean, you can tape him, but you can't use it unless you get permission. So, and, you know, we stood back. And, but I heard him, and he lived, I heard in Falls Church, Virginia, which is very near where I live. And I called General Corelli when I got back and said, can you help me find his parents? Because if that was my child, I would, want to know what happened to him during the day or any stories I could tell. So we ended up, I ended up going with General Corelli. As soon as Mark got to Walter Reed, we both went up. And I know it meant an enormous amount to Mark's parents that General Corelli came 
and followed up. And I, I swear he can tell you everything about every soldier. He's just, uh, and he's retiring in January, but he's, uh, he's, he's been a really super, super advocate for, for the wounded and, and for his soldiers, and they love him. Should we do one more? I guess that means it's my turn. I guess it is. <laughs> Thank you. I've really appreciated your talk. But Thank to you. To switch gears a little bit, could you say which would be the best and which would be the worst countries to live in as a female of the places in the Middle East that you've covered? Uh, um, I think it's, di well, it's difficult in Iran and it's difficult in Saudi Arabia. Um, it, it, it's difficult in Iran because you absolutely have to stay completely covered. And I, I think probably Iran's probably the single hardest place to live. But Saudi Arabia, you can't, you know, you can't drive. They just opened up the voting. But I, I remember going in when I was traveling with President Bush or Vice President Cheney or someone, and um, I wanted to go to the gym. And it's like, oh, 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 don't even think about it. So it's, I, I mean, certainly for a Western female, that kind of stuff drives you completely out of your mind bonkers. So it's, it, it's, tough, to, it's tough to be there. You can't really even go out without a guy. Um, you know, Yemen, even though everyone covers their hair, it's, I, I felt completely comfortable there. And I don't usually, when I go to these places, wear a headscarf. Um, you had to in Iran. You had to. You, had, you couldn't broadcast without a headscarf on if you were in, in the government, but in the, in the government area where you have to broadcast from. Um, but so that would be difficult. The best, did you say the best place in there? I, I mean, you know, there's lots of places that would be fine to live, but it's definitely more difficult for a Western female, particularly me. <laughs> sure, we'll do. One more. Uh huh. Um, you spoke about uh, in the first few years of the Iraq war as a journalist and especially as a White, Horse, uh, White House correspondent, um, uh, the focus being on the validity of the U.S. being in Iraq. I'm interested in uh, your opinion, given your extensive first-hand knowledge both in the White House with um, the previous administration officials and uh, with the soldiers on the ground. Uh, your opinion as to whether the lack of any or the lack of uh, accountability towards the previous administration for uh, you know as to the reason why they entered um, in the lack of uh, you know the current administration allowing or or not trying to give any kind of uh, uh, Accountability? Accountability or... From you know, them? I, I would like to use a I more think they got their hands full. <laughs> their hands full now. I, I mean, I think this was so heavily debated after the invasion and after weapons of mass destruction. We're not, I, a, oops. A million books that have been written about this and the accountability. I think they've all been asked the question again and again. I mean, I know Condoleezza Rice just wrote a book and still says they should have gone in. It's one of those things that you're either going to go, what are, what are they talking about? Or, yeah, I agree with you. But I think pre, it's pretty generally understood that there was the reasons they said for going in there were not, it did not happen. Um, I covered that UN presentation by Colin Powell. And I actually, I look back and there's, uh, uh, Peter Jennings was like an amazing man, and Peter Jennings, you probably don't remember, <laughs> but Peter Jennings was just hardcore, ask, 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 ask. He was a great mentor. And I know he had real doubts about whether there were weapons, and he was one of the few people. And I remember our exchange afterwards, because it was the German and French who really weren't wanting to go along with this and saying, look, the German and French, and I said, the German and French are gonna find a lot of, just this is circumstantial evidence. Um, but, you know, we didn't have access to classified material as the media. I know the media has gotten pounded for this and we probably should have asked more and more and more, but you also don't have the material that they had. Um, and, I, I, but, but I think it's been debated. And I think this administration doesn't really want to go back and debate that again. And, you know, as I said, they've, they've got their hands full with the economy and so many other things. Do you think Thank that? 
do you think that's more detrimental to our our foreign policy throughout the rest of the world that we that we went to we not hold it's, them hold them to task rather just well uh, I kind think of let it wash given your you know the amount of interaction that you have with with uh, well I, I mean certainly countries. certainly going into Iraq was I, I mean by the rest of the world there were people who didn't agree with that at all mm -hmm. and I don't you know I don't know what you do to hold someone accountable I mean you ask questions you write books you write articles you say that they didn't find weapons of mass destruction you debate whether it hurt our foreign policy and then I don't I don't know what you do thank you fortunately that one's not my job <laughs> thank you very much thanks thank you again I really appreciate it thanks Thank you.